The funny thing about complex psychology is that it's the only psychology we've got, so we might as well enjoy it. This is my conversation with Dr. Nakia Hamlet. What if the truth came in a gel cap and we could just pop it in our mouths and forget about it? Well, it doesn't, and we can't. But we can laugh in the face of reality while plotting our survival. Welcome to the Truth Tastes Funny podcast. I am your host, Hirsch Repun. And if my guests can handle the truth, so can you. Open wide, folks. Here it comes. My guest today is Dr. Nakia Hamlet. She helps organizations and individuals build safe spaces through communication and really seeks to bring out the humanity in all of our interactions. And from what I've learned, tries to help us also have a happier life as, as human beings. Dr. Hamlet, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very My happy pleasure. to be here. My pleasure. How did you get into clinical psychology? Well, you know, I, the funny story is that I was always told by my family and friends that I used to tell people I was going to be a psychologist when I was like eight, which I don't know. I, I think a lot of times we kind of study what we're trying to figure out. So my guess is that I just was always interested in human behavior in my own family in general. And I, I never really kind of thought about too many other careers. I don't know. I was always fascinated by, by human behavior and the psyche uh, and thinking about those things when I was even eight, nine years old. So I kind of just had that as a goal. And then I just kind of charted a course to grad school, undergrad, you know, then grad school. Now, how did it, how did that, at eight years old, how did that lay out? I have an eight-year-old now who wears... <laughs> who is, since she was five, loves going to the Children's Museum and dressing up in scrubs and working on <laughs> toy animals and fortune toy that. animals. But, you know, like has a real Doc McStuffins <laughs> kind of persona. But how did it play as a youngster, you know, really being interested in behavior? Yeah, you know, well, for one thing, most obviously, I was just an avid reader. You know, I was kind of the bookworm, so I kind of always found books fascinating. I remember reading like The Princess Bride was one of my favorite and first books. There was a series, I can't remember the name of it, but there was a, a girl named Anastasia was this series of books. Oh, yeah. And yeah. she used to talk to Freud. She had a Freud head in her room and she would kind of chat with him. And I just kind of always remembered like, wow, Freud, who is that? And I just, I think from books, I just got into really kind of thinking about characters and fantasy life and people. What was your upbringing like? What was the environment like around you? Yeah, you know, I had a pretty interesting environment because I was raised primarily in the younger years by my, my mom, who was single. My parents divorced when I was really young. And so my mom was someone who really always kind of saw the importance of education. And so she sacrificed so that I could go to private school. So I actually went to Catholic school. And then I went to a private school, pretty affluent school, and was, you know, one of few African-American students. So I kind of went through this period of having a really robust, like, educational environment, but a lot of hard social challenges because I was so different socioeconomically and culturally from my classmates. But I do think being at that school kind of gave me a love of learning. And so from there, I just was very focused on school and college and just always thought that education was really the path for me. And that was yeah. really my relentless focus. Well, and it, it's gotten you here. And now you're also very involved in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So tell me a little bit about that work. Yeah, you know, that, that has evolved. You know, as a psychologist, when you're in grad school and I've been a professor throughout the years, you know, you do research and you kind of think about like, what am I interested in? What are social topics that are important? And I've always worked with, you know, people from different cultural backgrounds as an African-American woman, you know, African-American mental health is personally important to me. And the equity and justice work kind of just grew out of it necessarily because you see so many disparities in health, 
And you see disparities kind of at times in academic tenure track kind of positions. And so the equity work just kind of became part of what I always focused on. And probably six, seven, eight years ago, I started to consult to companies and just really thinking about what does it mean to be an employee and thrive where you work. So I kind of think of the DEI, like you said, more like humanity, like how do we create spaces? How do organizations create spaces where everyone can really feel included and thrive? Because we spend a lot of our time at work. Well, in an environment like today, it's possible for employees to feel that companies are doing something because they have to. On sure. uh, one hand, it's great that people are so aware and tuned in and, you know, that it, that there are so many people committed to mm -hmm. creating safe spaces at work and comfortable workplaces and equitable workplaces. But at the same time, are you coming across employees that feel, oh, this company just has, they have to do, they have to, it's just something they're doing in writing. It's something they're doing perfunctorily. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, resistance, right, is a word I hear a lot in my DEI coach, coach and consultant colleagues. You know, it's just the idea that when you come in with this kind of perspective, people automatically have ideas about what it means. And so I think when you say diversity, equity, and inclusion, yes, it's easy for people to feel like they don't really care and they're just performative. But it's also on the other side of it, easy to think this is going to be a situation where I'm made to feel really ashamed and uncomfortable. And I have a lot of my own unmanaged feelings. So I think for me, it's just how do you approach it? And I try to approach it as if all humans actually want to have connections. The question is, how do we build connections? How do we learn to communicate and understand each other? So when I hear like, oh, they're just doing this because they have to, that just says to me that we haven't figured out the approach to really make connected dots for people. Right. And what's the, what's generally speaking, the first step toward a safer space? I honestly, more recently, I've really started to really scale it back in my mind. I think creating intentional learning circles and maybe in teams where people can just start to create space to get to know each other and have conversations. And the interesting thing is even without mentioning things like gender or race or religion, if you have humans in a room long enough, they get to those things. And so I think companies can just start by creating a place where people can share stories, they can learn about each other, and then have some facilitation for when things like gender do emerge or people, you know, have difficulties with communication. But I think we don't give humans enough credit that, like, we do want to build connections. And if we could create spaces to do that, the rest kind of comes together. What do you think about the maturity of corporate environments? My world is the advertising industry. And I think because advertising is often a reflection of society necessarily, right? They have to sell to their consumers. Therefore, they have to start to look like the consumer more. But it took forever yep. uh, for change to come in that world. You know, it just felt like the old guard, the old ways, the old thinking yeah. was so ingrained. Yeah. What do you think about that, that challenge? What is the landscape looking like now? You know, it's the way I've been thinking about it, because we live in this technological age, I think analog and digital, right? We still have people and things that function kind of analog. Like certain people are not doing a lot on the internet, right? They're maybe checking their email. Other people are figuring out all kind of technological magic. So I think of companies the same way. And there's spaces where they're still sort of functioning in a more analog fashion where there's not a lot of diversity, the conversation's not really progressive, lots of bias that doesn't really get explored. And then there are spaces that are trying to be more progressive and more advanced. And so the question is, when we have new technology, right, maybe it's humanity as we are trying to see it in the future, how do we bring people along? You know, some people want to be analog. They don't ever want to actually let go of their DVR. Other people... You know, other people are all 
early adopters of all the new stuff. And I kind of think of companies and individuals the same way. And then I think there's just a different roadmap, whether you're dealing with one or the other. Yeah. Now, as far as helping professionals find their happy place, you know, talk to me a little bit about what we can do as human beings to somehow direct ourselves to happiness, because I think thriving, surviving, going as far as we can toward happiness is probably a, a decent antidote to some of the, <laughs> some of the stuff that drags us down. Right. So, yeah. so how do we find happiness? Man, that's a big question. I know it is. And I felt as I was asking it, but I felt like I would throw it out there because there's no wrong answer. You know, there's just, there's just observations. And I think you're in a good position to make some observations about human nature. Well, thank you. I mean, like I said, I, I do think about this a lot. You know, I, I called my company Complex Psychology because of the complexity of, of our world. So I actually think that our, this might sound controversial, but our pursuit of happiness is what makes us unhappy in a lot of ways because yeah, life is, it. yeah, it's fluid, right? And moment to moment, we can feel joy and moment to moment, we can feel stress. And I think the key to happiness, at least, is allowing for all of it. And instead of pushing against, right? And that's kind of maybe mindfulness type talk. But wherever you go, there you are. So moment to moment, I think we have choices and we also have the ability to remain open. And I think that that sets the foundation for really, truly experiencing joy when it comes, like family time, fun events, a sunny day. But I think that's half the problem. I think we're always so afraid to feel bad that we avoid it at all costs. But the truth is, we're all those things. And I think by embracing all those things is how we really, truly find contentment. Well, what I find happens is that, is that I, and the more I talk to people, the more I'm trying to learn and grow. I'm not doing this show just for the listener. I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm doing it because I think the listener can relate to what my journey is because I don't think it's any very different from from what other people are going through. But I feel like, you know, I intellectually understand the benefit yeah. of experiencing sadness and yeah. frustration and welcoming all those emotions in and then just processing them and trying to learn from them. And that sounds yeah. great. But then yeah. I'll get what I'll find is I'll become very quickly, very profoundly sad oh, and yeah. over, over whatever is going, whatever the moment is, or maybe it's something that hit me a couple days later, but I'll start to feel that sadness and I w I'll forget about the ability to, to process and to experience, Ooh, I'm going to dive into this sadness. I'm, this is awesome. This is the sadness that I was just talking about the other day. <laughs> Else. Now I have a chance to dive in and enjoy no. swim in the swim in the sand, and uh, and all that stuff goes out the window, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, yeah it feels awful. And I meditate. I've been meditating for about a year, and I'm like, okay, I you know I have that to go to, and I always find something useful in there. But that doesn't mean an hour later, like that may help for a little bit, but. An hour later, that same thing may circle back. And I, and I really have a hard time diving into the emotion. Do you have any tips on that? Any tips for settling into sadness? You know, what's fascinating is, is it, maybe it's a semantics thing because I certainly, when I say accept, I certainly don't mean to dive into it. I probably mean the opposite. I actually think that when we experience bad emotions or sad emotions, it's almost like, okay, thank you. I'm, you. I see that you're here, and now what? As opposed to, oh, sadness is back. Here we go. I'm going down this rabbit hole. Now I'm sad. Am I still sad? Do I feel better? I think I'm still sad. I mean, I, I actually think the focus on it and actually giving it our attention is not the same thing as acknowledging it. It's almost like you can acknowledge a person in the room, and maybe it's someone that you don't really want to talk to, you can acknowledge them 
and you don't have to have a full on conversation. You can yeah. kind of continue as you were. And to me, it's shifting the focus. That is actually, I, I see that you're here. I accept it. And now I'm going to continue on, you know, doing something. I'll take a walk. I'll do whatever. So right. you're saying, so you're saying we don't have to date. Yeah, that opinion. It's not like you have a right to be here in my space. It's more, okay, I see you. I see you, you know, but I'm going to, I'm going to do this right now. It's like leaving it in the waiting room. All, you know, it's, it, it's can't come into your office. It's sitting there and you're like, yeah, I see you. Absolutely. I mean, and it's deeper than this, right? Cause you, you know, it's, it's the idea that this is lovingly embraced as a part of you. And while you may not need to give it your focus because you want to feel better and in a moment, if you're kind of diving deep in your sad thoughts, you probably won't feel better. But it's acknowledging that, like, it's honoring it almost. Like, the idea that, okay, where does sadness come from? I mean, if you lost a loved one, that grief is very real and should be honored. If if it's that, you know, you're just having stress at work, whatever it is, it's, it's honoring and acknowledging it without feeling like, now that has to be what I do is the sadness thing. It's like, it's here. It's part of my experience. But so is the, the beautiful breeze right now, and so are the flowers, and so is this nap I'm going to take, or so is this delicious ice cream I'm going to eat. Uh, I kind of learned from my own personal experience that at some point, and I think this is a book from like the 70s that my mom had, but at some point, it's the idea we can't afford the luxury of a negative thought. And I just, I just don't go there myself anymore if I can help it. That doesn't mean I have every day is super happy. But I just, I don't know if it's worth wrestling your sadness to the ground and trying to win it over. Now, let's talk a little bit about professional psychological health, trying to achieve your dream. You know, are we, are we setting goals too far ahead? Or is that a good mm -hmm. thing to have, that horizon that we're always looking to? Or is it a little bit overwhelming to do that? I mean, again, it's funny. It, I, I kind of see these as some as similar struggles. I think ambition is a wonderful thing, but I don't think we trust ourselves in the process enough, you know, to kind of like, and I, I'm guilty of this as the next person. When you're ambitious, you're like, have these goals, but then you're measuring your progress to the goal and the distance that still remains versus the progress you've made. So... I just, I don't know if we spend enough time saying like, wow, look how much progress I've made from 10 years ago. Yeah, there's still, there's always going to be things I want to do more. I, I just think we live in a culture that kind of teaches us to obsessively pursue achievements and things and money and titles. Well, the thing that I keep coming up against in my, in my journey of this podcast. Truth Tastes Funny came from a stage show that I am developing. So it was originally going to be comedy and music and it was, it was going to touch on some things, but it was going to be like semi-autobiographical comedy and music. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And then the opportunity to do the podcast came up and that led to the opportunity to talk to people. I was going to include a book, but I, I had a different idea for the book. Now I think the book could be about what I've learned in the, in the journey of these conversations, one of the things that I keep coming back to hearing that my guests keep bringing up is judgment and from different cool. points of view, but yeah. our relationship with the judgment and opinions of others, in many cases that can determine whether we think we've succeeded or not. What are your thoughts on that? It's so true. I mean, and it's interesting because I think inherently we think like oh our thoughts like you said are, are things we should t contend with and our you know our minds our thoughts are here to help us but the truth is you kind of have to focus your mind and your thoughts and there is a part of everyone that is you know fearful or judgmental and i think it's also noticing i i, I think it's the same thing that like okay am i judging myself am i judging other people it's a natural human tendency to do so the question is how far do we take it? I mean, if you want to do better and you're judging that you're not quite where you want to be, that's learning. That could be objective information. But if we get into self-criticism and, you know, 
self-flagellation, you know, beating yourself up about something or, you know, judging other people and on some standard that makes them not want to spend time with us or be in relationship with us, then I mean, then it's worth considering. Yeah. But judgment is kind of part of our nature, though, I, th I think. What was your experience? Did you experience judgment, expectation, criticism, things like that as a, as a child and student and young, you know, young adult? Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing, right? Like our parents do their best. They don't mean to kind of sometimes impart wounds of their own on us yeah. or their own ideas about things or their own fears. And so for sure, I've over the years gotten messages about what I should do, what I shouldn't do, and, you know, if I'm doing a good job. And over time, I think it comes down to how strong a sense of self-esteem and self-efficacy you have so that when judgment comes, either from yourself or someone else, you can kind of say, you know, I am actually a good person and I'm doing pretty great. And, and to me, if you can really deeply feel that, that you are a worthy and good person, then the judgment kind of doesn't stick in the same way. I think when there is some insecurity, which we all have, and people tap into it with their judgment, it hurts more than it would if we had already kind of worked through the judging of ourselves, if that makes sense. Right. right. And what about technology, the role that technology plays in making our lives better? And is it impeding our personal growth, do you think? You know, I think it's the culture more than the technology. And I say that because as we kind of briefly talked about, you know, as they're trying to figure out how do robots, how do they teach robots to be human, sentient, right? It's really kind of that kind of research has given me a real eye-opening look at like, Okay, is this what humanity is objectively when you when you kind of see what they're trying to kind of impart to machines? Then that's not the part that the technology part, it's what we use technology for. It's how technology has kind of evolved because of our of capitalism and our culture's tendency towards work and achievement. I mean, if we were all on Instagram, you know, posting our flowers or art yeah. we made. Yeah. Would it be bad technology? No, but that's not what we use it for. Well, we also don't want, we, we, we rail against being controlled, regardless of where you are on the, uh, on the, on the political spectrum or any issues. What I think we, we all have in common as a society, as a global society is we, some people want to be told what to do. Of course, some people like to key into something that keeps their lives simple and then they just follow and that's what but still those people don't want to be told what to do so if they choose a system that guides them that's their yeah. that is literally their choice so they want to be able to choose even the system that may be restrictive but they want to choose that system they don't want someone to choose a system for them so you know we we rail against control yeah. But with self-determination comes responsibility. Sure. Right? And so are we, are we nowadays with all the stuff that we've been going through, do you find people seizing control more or relinquishing it? You know, I, I think humans, I mean, I tend to think in kind of broad strokes sometimes, but like we have love and we have fear. And love is things you love to do, your family, your friends, hobbies, passions and creative energy, all that stuff. And fear is anger and that gut reaction. And I, I just think we live in a f world that, in, that keeps us in that fear place, so like fear that there's not enough, fear that people are going to steal my rights or take something from me, fear of violence. And so... I think people are much more in that, like, I got to hold on to control f out of fear. I don't think it comes from a place of well-being. I think it's right. just like we feel like we're grappling for these limited resources. It's funny. You, you, you've said a couple of times, you know, I hope I'm not getting too complex. And, 
And it's funny because your, your company's called Complex Psychology. <laughs> and if I had my way and I could open up a, a company, I would call it Simpleton. <laughs> that's my, my goal. I always yeah. complicate things. I complicate, you know, creative <laughs> ideas. I complicate, yeah. you know, and I'm a good problem solver in some ways I bet. and I'm also yeah. but I'm also like overthink simple things so we're blessed with this duality of so of simplicity and complexity and and I and I I don't know how to swing that into into great balance but I know that we're just like we just know how to how to complicate things we know how to introduce even in our inventions right what is it like in the in the psychological community among psychologists among your peer what are some of the challenges that they're facing these days is there any kind of disruption within the community about how best to deal with some of the some of the PTSD and traumas that people are going through I mean I think for one thing the demand is is overwhelming I mean I think COVID, through COVID, people realize like, oh, maybe therapy is helpful. Maybe I need therapy. Maybe I should talk to someone. And what that means is the demand is great and the number of clinicians that, that are able to meet that or therapists is, is, is not matching it. So I think the challenge now is figuring out, you know, how do we use these, these technological tools to reach more people? Are we able to help people help themselves? And then it's ongoing. I think one real challenge is that one thing is, as therapists, we're still dealing with our own trauma from all the things that have happened in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And then it hasn't ended. I mean, every day you turn the news on and it's like the next part of the puzzle. So how do you help people when you're also kind of gain, trying to gain your own equilibrium and manage? I think it's really hard. Given that we need because I thought of this right away when COVID was going on and we with medical professionals becoming overwhelmed. What can we as lay people do to kind of return the, the favor and help, you know, just like, is there, is there a, something in that dynamic? Cause it's a relationship like any other, you know, yeah. and sometimes we abuse almost the providers that we need the most, you know, we take them for granted or we're so desperate that we just don't, we can't, we can't, that, worry ourselves with burnout and other issues. Is there something we can do for the medical and psychological community? That's a, that's a really excellent question. I mean, it's thoughtful that you would even ask that. I mean, it kind of goes back to what you said before, that everyone is focused on what do I want and my rights and what's best for me. And I think if we could collectively realize that in a lot of cases, what's best for us as individuals is what's best for all of us. So. I mean, when the COVID was going on with the nursing staff and the doctors, it's like they were telling people, like, wear masks, you know, don't be in groups because we can't handle this many people getting sick. And people are like, no, I don't want to wear a mask or no, I want to have my family over. So I think more and more, if we could think about what would serve all of us at this point versus maybe an individual need. I mean, I don't know if that's going to happen, but to me, it's it's taken a collective kind of perspective more than what's just best for me and my family. Yeah. Well, maybe it comes down to just being partners, at least in our, in our mental health and the mental health of others. If we maybe saw ourselves a little bit more like, like doctors, like medical professionals and, and health as a parent, you know, certainly we're responsible for the mental health of our children. We're not responsible from a clinical point of view or from a yeah. professional point of view, but we're partners in that with our schools, with our, with, with doctors, with everybody. Right. Um, so maybe if we took just a partnership approach instead of a service provider approach, you know, you're here to provide a service. Let's, let's, let's get back to that human level of how can we help everybody do their job? How can I help? We could take those words and maybe throw those out a little more. <laughs> maybe so that's true. helpful. Takes a uh, village, right? It's just yeah. not like that so much anymore. Yeah. I think the answer isn't in, let's put it this way. We know this much. The answer isn't in pushing each other away or pulling ourselves 
apart. Families, families is a great place to start. You know, it would be great to see people be able to have conversations again about it, about anything. This has become a great, a big thing on social media, the AMAs, right? They ask me mm -hmm. anything session. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, yeah. and yet you can't go to your mother's house for dinner and in some cases and have a come and ask me anything because you have to avoid topics, you know? You're right. I mean, it's just how do we get back to humanity? And, and that's it. Like conversations, you know, honesty, transparency. And I don't know. I just feel like we're all kind of overwhelmed these days. And I think it's hard to find spaces where you feel like you can kind of have honest conversations without repercussions. And the political stuff is so derisive that people are cautious about having those conversations. So it's just, it's just challenging, I think, challenging times. Well, it's fortunate that you had the clarity that you had at eight years old <laughs> to know that the work that you're doing now would be so important. You definitely had some, some clarity uh, about the human condition at a young age. And I, I think we're all better for it. So, so thank you for coming on and thank you for for introducing what you do to our audience, certainly. And it's, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Same. And thank you for having me and, and keep up the great work. I mean, these are an important conversation. So I, I'm grateful to people like you who are having these spaces for these conversations. Thanks so much for tuning into Truth Tastes Funny. If you enjoyed the experience, please leave a five-star review and share this podcast with your friends.